which is uh, Dr. Ricky Smith's um, updated report to return in person. Dr. Ricky Smith. Thank you so much. Uh, Patty, if you'd please pull up the slide deck. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, please, Patty. And so the key concepts this evening, uh, just as, a, as an update, and I will quickly step through a number of the slides that um, we have received from ODE uh, for this evening's presentation. But the, um, the thrust of this evening is to give um, the board an update relative to what the, re, what the final revised metrics, advisory metrics from the state of Oregon are, uh, where we are with staff vaccination, and then our transition to limited in-person and hybrid pre-K-3 timeline. Next slide, please. And again, just as a reminder uh, that these are the things that we are committed to in terms of in, that we are committed to in-person instruction, uh, that we use equity staff and student safety and, pub and community public health lenses as we are doing moving our work forward and that we are committed. And I wanna be very clear about this. There is discrete work that is being done to return to in-person instruction for those families who desire this model for the remainder of the 2021 school year, while also providing um, an online option for those families who have indicated that they wish to uh, remain online even with a hybrid option. Next slide, please. And again, as a reminder, the, the district offers two models, hybrid and complete distance, um, complete distance learning. Currently, there um, are invitations from each of our elementary schools going out to parents for meetings this week uh, to receive information and to ask them for their choice, whether they will, if they have uh, had been assigned to the hybrid model, whether they wish to remain or whether they wish to shift to online. And if anyone online wishes now to make a choice to, to shift to hybrid. We are doing this by grade band by level um, as it is an amazing amount of work um, on HR's part. Uh, to uh, reassign students if there is some shifts um, and we have a limit, limited set of options. And so the sooner that we know parent choice, um, one level by at a time, uh, we are able to, to make those, uh, those shifts. Um, and then certainly as the metrics allow for middle and secondary, and we will talk about that in brief this evening, uh, then it will be the same um, process there. Next slide, please. And this is just a reminder from ODE and that in-person learning, uh, you must take a measured approach and follow the protocols with fidelity. And this is just uh, their way of, of helping uh, reinforce the message that we have been offering um, at, since the beginning of this process. Next slide, please. And again, you are to start with the youngest learners, pre-K-3. And I know that this is frustrating for middle and secondary families, but this has to do with the science relative to the phys physiology and development of, of younger students. Um, and they are less efficient in terms of, of spread. Um, and therefore there is a greater uh, flexibility in terms of bringing them online first, setting up a hybrid, uh, getting protocols in place, and then carefully adding and phasing in the next uh, levels, uh, grade levels as the metrics allow. Next um, slide, please. And then opening schools uh, requires the public health and safety protocols. And then again, would ask our community if they are interested uh, or have questions to refer to our blueprints, uh, which there is one for the district and one for individual schools. Um, and as I, we referenced, um, the district, the buildings are going through the 53 page checklist. And certainly if there are specific questions relative to your school and where they are in the process, uh, I will make certain this evening and ask uh, the director fields as she speaks to Libby uh, also provide some guidance as to how parents can get that information. Next slide, please. Um, the county metrics remain in force um, and uh, the chart in the Ready School Safe Learners is our best tool for determining when cases are not enough to return to in-person. 
Uh, and so again, we'll do a quick step through of the, the metrics um, relative to the advisory metrics that this is referencing. Also schools, as we bring students in, um, both for LIPI, uh, limited in person, um, as well as for hybrid, we must submit a weekly report to ODE from each school as to the numbers of students, what they received, um, and where we are in terms of any potential outbreaks. Next slide, please. Um, community count, count case rates are need to be considered. Um, and we are actively working to ensure that new cases of COVID are not introduced into our schools because as new cases are introduced, we are, schools have been very efficient in squelching um, those outbreaks, but it is at the cost of the entire cohort that must go into quarantine for 14 days and there, therefore disrupt the in-person opportunity of learning. Next slide, please. We are in the process of um, developing, practicing, and training our staff. And then this is built into the timeline relative to returning of our elementary students, um, um, time for training of staff, and then um, preparing for transition into the classroom. Um, this will include, um, and this is work with our parent community as well, uh, diligent entry screening. And we will be relying heavily on families to screen for some signs and symptoms of potential COVID exposure and not sending the child to school school, um, mandatory face coverings, physical distancing, cohorting uh, where appropriate, frequent hand washing, uh, all of which is covered in the Ready School Safe Learners sections one through three. Next slide, please. To the question of the advise, uh, the metrics, these metrics are advisory. Um, and by that, it means that a district um, must weigh those in addition to other considerations in their partnership uh, with their local um, health agency, which for us, we have two, Washington County and Clackamas County. Um, and that uh, we are by, um, by guidance from ODE required to offer Two op at least two options, hybrid in person and an online option for parents who do not wish to have their student in a hybrid situation. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, the, the metrics have gone from required to advisory. These are based um, on the Harvard Global Studies uh, Institute. And the link here will uh, link anyone interested. These, these slides will be posted uh, to that study. This is the one that Dr. Fauci uh, frequently references and a number of epidemiologists and those that are in the field of epidemiologists, epidemiology reference uh, the Harvard uh, Global Metrics as to setting thresholds where we believe students can come safely into in-person without outbreaks versus uh, when we need to press pause. Um, the, the continued impacts of COVID-19 and the state's evolving mitigation efforts are directly related um, and governed by Governor Brown and the Oregon Health Authority. So to the question, who is it that we, um, we send our advocacies to? It continues to be the governor and Oregon Health Authority. Next slide, please. And these are the revised metrics for the state of Oregon. Um, and let me just pull my notes up here. Um, and so you can see, um, again, very similar to the last chart, but the threshold has risen. So um, we can entertain elementary on-site hybrid transition um, at up to um, less than or equal to 350 per 100,000. Anything over 350 per 100,000 and or a test positivity of greater than 10% uh, requires that the district consider and uh, strongly consider going into comprehensive distance learning, but continuing to offer LIPI uh, regardless of the level um, of, di of disease. This is a shift from the required metrics where even LIPI was shut down. Um, and so that is being planned for and that would continue. Currently, as of today, these are today's metrics for um, the January 23rd. Clackamas County is at 20, 226 per 100,000 and a test positivity of 5.2. Multnomah is at 243.3 and a test positivity of 4.4. And as a reminder, the reason we must track Multnomah is because greater than 10% of our workforce uh, resides in that county. And lastly, Washington County um, is the highest at 289.4 and a test positivity of 5.4. 
all of these numbers are a significant improvement over the previous um, week's reporting. And so currently we are on the backside of the Thanksgiving uh, Christmas holiday surge. You will notice also the advisory instructional model. So we are clearly in the orange bracket. We are to prioritize a careful phasing in of on-site or hybrid for elementary schools. It is not until we are under 200 per 100,000 that we may begin to consider middle school and high school um, if we have successfully brought on K-5 without incident or minimal incident. And it is not until we are under 50 per 100,000 um, that we can actually get to K-12 hybrid. And so for the concerns relative to where is middle and, and high school currently, um, we would not be planning actively right now to um, bring cohorts in for hybrid. We are actively planning to bring small groups uh, relative to limited in-person and Director Amber Fields will provide that information in just a moment. Next slide, please. This is a, a graph that is produced by Dr. Peter Graven, who is a um, health um, economics um, specialist that works for OSHU. His claim to he is not an epidemiologist, but he has been used extensively by the state uh, and by the hospital associations to model behaviors that will predict um, COVID surges. And so you can, you can see early on, uh, if you go to the far left of this graph, that first bump is where we were when we closed school back in March. Um, and you can see the amplitude at that point, case rate was somewhere around 150 per 100,000. Um, yeah, and then you can see that we came on the backside of that as we came into summer. That next sort of smaller hump was the summer's um, outbreak um, that ultimately led us to go to an online stance. Um, and just about the time before that next spike comes was when all of our districts had received the first set of revised metrics. We were actively planning with our K-3 teachers and staff to um, look to return to hybrid at that point, and then cases went through the roof. Um, and the reason for that um, is because people, again, uh, became, he, Dr. Graven speaks of a fear fatigue cycle where people see that, that cases are increases and become fearful and become far more vigilant with their, with their COVID routines. And then we have a drop on the backside, um, as you now see that we are, are, are coming on the backside of our third spike. Um, and then again, people become more complacent. And then we head into yet another spike because of a lack of adherence to mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing and such. Uh, where we are right now, the metrics that I have read for you this evening are at about the bottom um, of this, uh, just beyond, a little bit beyond that, the end of that red line. So we're into that dip. Now, Dr. Graven says, um, and I think it is worth bearing, um, it's sharing this information and re really reinforcing it. We can push that dip further out to the right if we are absolutely adherent to mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing, limiting our bubbles to no more than two households, um, you know, really clamping down on um, the size of our bubbles. We can push that out. In addition, uh, with vaccines coming on, there is great hope that number one, the amplitude of the next spike will be lower and further out, but those things must happen. And those are a direct result of how actively our community takes this to heart, learns from these fear and um, fatigue cycles, and actively continues to push that, that cycle out until vaccines finally can take a firm hold, which is what you see towards the end um, of June going into the summer, when the, the belief is that there will be enough vaccine into the system um, that we will begin to gain some control um, over this pandemic. Next slide, please. So relative to limited in person, next slide, please. The key date, data here is that limited in person is meant to be supplemental instruction um, in addition to virtual online learning. Uh, and so uh, it is not meant to replace um, online learning. It requires that we have no more than a co cohorts of 20 students and no more than two cohorts in any given week uh, for, for those students. 
uh, no more than two hours um, and it cannot be intermittent. So you can't do 30 minutes here and 30 minutes there and 30 minutes someplace else. Um, th this, is, this is prescribed um, and it is a guidance that we are expected to follow. Uh, next slide, please. I've asked uh, Director Carol Kinch and Director Amber Fields to address both the academic um, needs relative and thinking relative to limited in-person as well as the social, emotional and mental health needs for our middle and secondary students. So I will ask them to open their mic and provide just a brief update as to where we are in terms of types of limited in-person that are, are being developed and will come online, timeline for, for those to come online and any other considerations relative to uh, gathering parent input at the middle and secondary level, levels. Directors Kench and Fields, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rocky Smith. We are uh, looking who TTSD is prioritizing for Libby is aligned with the guidance. Um, and we will be focusing on students who are not able to engage in CDL students who need in-person specialized services, for example, special education, ELD, reading intervention, in order to access CDL, students who need improved connectivity access alongside a caring adult in order to engage in CDL, as well as students needing tier two and tier three support services in order to engage in CDL. Um, and how we develop those lists, this first round of who will be um, starting with limited in-person, is principals use their data from their multi-tiered systems of support process, where they review live grades, work completion, basic needs, and attendance data every two weeks. They cross-reference these data points in order to generate a list of students that need deeper support in order to access and or succeed in CDL. So aligned to the priorities that I mentioned above, um, these students will be our first priority for limited in-person, and we'll be looking to start small and expand to additional cohorts of students as metrics improve, as guidance of time allowed on campus expands, and staff receive vaccination. Director Kinch. Good evening. Um, so one of the other areas that has been a primary focus is special education, and I know we've spoken about this before, um, but the first group of students that will be coming into our buildings will be a small number of elementary students with disabilities that significantly impact their um, their ability to access anything related to comprehensive distance learning. Sometimes um, these are students who may get paper pencil packets at their homes. Um, it's a group of students who are primarily working on functional type goals and not at working in their general education classroom. So that is actually starting this week with some meet and greets and orientation with um, our elementary families. And then our goal is to build up into middle and high school. Um, and most of those students will be served in a central location at Tuality Middle School. Um, so we can make sure that we have all the systems in place. Um, this is a group of students that um, are more one-on-one, -on -one, two on one, three on one, and require staff to wear a higher level of PPE in some situations. So we wanted to keep all of our expertise in one place and it also helps with transportation. Um, the goal is to also start talking about elementary and whether elementary can offer some limited in-person services and supplementary instruction. Um, but their focus has been on reopening K-5 at this point, and we will continue to have conversations with them and Title I and ELL. And we wanted to give a quick opportunity for Director Un to share some of the Lippy plans surrounding um, events that we could offer for students who may be struggling with isolation. So Director Un, do you wanna give a quick summary of what you're working on? Yes, thank you. Um, so for our work with our basic needs team and our uh, culturally responsive coordinators and liaisons who've been hosting family affinity spaces and our student pillar uh, leaders hosting student um, affinity spaces, we've learned a lot about what the community's asking for. Um, we know that COVID has impacted our communities of color disproportionately and some of the um, insights that we got, not only about mental health um, around isolation, but um, how to address deep levels of trauma. When we're talking about 
the concentric circles of impact for COVID and how it's closing in on a lot of our communities. I know I've heard from students and families that they have talked about um, loss of family members of um, them themselves going through um, and experiencing COVID and um, the uncertainty of those pieces. So um, connection with our, um, our facts uh, opportunities uh, or family affinity connection series, we have partnered with um, REAP, um, Latino Network, ERCO, around sharing information. A lot of the, um, uh, what we know about transition as highlighted by um, William Bridges is around the, um, the addressing of a new experience and then this navigating this uncertainty and then onto some um, uh, reopening schools. I think what we've heard from our partners in the city of uh, Tigard and the city of Tualatin, there's a lot of um, feelings of misinformation, not trusting information out there. And just as um, uh, Director Bowman had highlighted earlier, the information is changing so frequently that um, communities don't know what to trust. And so um, some of the uh, conversations that we've had along with um, city of Tiger and the city of Tualatin is hosting uh, Lippy events in partnership to share about um, these safety precautions and sharing and teaching and informing the uh, community about those pieces. Um, we're also with the support of our basic needs team um, every month we do a check-in around um, home visit protocols. What we learned at, is that um, some families and students need a little bit more insight and support. So we are gonna be coming together to su uh, support some of those um, more robust home visit protocols that utilizes partnerships with the apartment complexes or nearby parks. Um, and so that's the partnership with the city of Tiger and Tualatin to um, utilize some of their park spaces and um, in coordination with connecting with some of um, uh, their CERT teams about what they've done in uh, limited uh, in-person events. And then also just acknowledging some of those equity impacts. Uh, when we talked about mental health, um, you know, we have in our partners in REAP um, trauma-informed uh, um, practitioners that um, can speak from the eye perspective for our students of color and our other community partners as well. So those are some um, opportunities for the community to convene and also learn more about um, uh, our safety precautions and you know ease some of the misinformation or the um, lack of information they they felt that they haven't um, received. And to be clear, and Director Un, Director Kench, and Director Fields, these would also be open to any student um, or students who um, are, are are impacted by the, the by isolation. Yes. There will be opportunities for students, um, regardless who are who are isol feeling senses of isolation and, and 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 navigating issues relative to mental health and, and social emotional wellness. Uh, I, so, I can speak. Go ahead, Zinia. No, you, you go ahead. I think you're going to say what I was going to say. Um, probably not. What I was going to add is that Alfonso Ramirez, Russ Ramos, and um, Nick Sidlin will be hosting some parent listening sessions to understand and, uh, more about what the needs are of our community um, that, um, that and what services that we could offer. Um, and so that, that was in the works today. Um, Zinnia, were you going to add anything? Yeah, I was actually um, going to highlight that as well. Very similar to um, the concept of, um, you know, the uh, Bridges transition model. I think that meets anybody's needs, you know, to be able to support um, a new, um, you know, current reality requires some of those services, but we have um, those um, that Carol had highlighted currently in the secondary levels with the support of the um, SEL teams there. So the timeline, yes. uh, directors relative to uh, the ramp up of, of limited in-person. I missed the first part of that question. Can you repeat that? The timeline yeah. for limited in-person. So um, the timeline is a, a rolling start. So like I said, we have our 10 families coming in this week as we are doing training, safety trainings with our 
um, special ed limited in-person staff. Uh, Tuality is updating their blueprints and, and communicating with their staff and their families um, related to special education. And then at the same time, we are getting ready for the next wave of students, um, contacting those families. No family is required to send their student in for in-person services. It is an option for them. Um, so they will always have access to our CDL services, um, special education or otherwise. Uh, so it will be a rolling start and that will be similar to the secondary LIPI process as well. Um, they are working on identifying volunteer staffing. At this time, we are only asking for volunteers. Um, and so we are working on getting all the schools staffed up to do the limited in-person that we hope to offer. Okay. Thank you. Director Fields, anything else you'd like to add uh, re relative to timeline? I would just add that um, with the focus group that Director Kinch talked about starting February 1st, um, our goal, assuming we can get the staff lined up, again, since we're seeking volunteers, the goal is to start that Feb the week of February 8th with that first group. And again, a starting small, proving that we can do it with success and mitigate um, you know, as much risk as possible and the safety of all build that muscle around all of our protocols and then ex expand accordingly. Thank you. All right, next slide, please. Hybrid in person, next slide. So um, what is required? Um, we are required uh, to maintain cohort sizes and, and they are outlined here. Um, students cannot be part of any single cohort or multiple cohorts that exceeds 100 people within an educational week. Um, the schools must maintain daily logs, and this is a practice that we have had um, over, over the many months that when staff enter into our buildings that there are daily logs, they must check in, they must check out, and we will do the same thing relative uh, with students. Uh, to minimize the number of staff that interact with each cohort, uh, we will probably continue to have relative within the hybrid for elementary that some of the specials will still remain online to minimize the impacts on cohorts and really allow um, a tight focusing to the classroom teacher experience. Um, and, um, and then really uh, working with the schedules uh, to reduce the number of, of cohorts and students that interact within a week. Again, the, the less interaction we are able to maintain with fidelity, the, less li the greater stability we will have in maintaining a consistent um, weekly schedule uh, without interruption due to uh, potential exposure to COVID uh, in the cohort. Next slide, please. Relative to transportation, um, if students are need to access the bus, they must, again, face masks are mandatory um, and we will take all necessary precautions. Uh, we are asking that students dress warmly because we will keep vents and windows open to the greatest extent possible, short of a, a, a deluge of rain, um, to make certain that we have as much air circulation as possible. Um, and also, our ability, these will not be full buses. These will be buses um, that are at best half full. And so we have already planned for additional buses on routes um, to accommodate for that. Um, the, the piece here that I want to leave is that they, this is not considered an additional cohort. Um, it is only relative to cohorting within the school building. So this is, this is, not, a co this is not considered a cohort that we have to, have to uh, necessarily be, con be concerned with. Next slide, please. Dr. Sue, just Dr. Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Sharon, I, I was going to say, I just, okay. my board members are going to be chomping at the bit to extend the meeting. I, um, I'm i sure, Sharon, is that what you wanted to do? I was, I was actually going to ask a question. I didn't even notice it was 930. <laughs> okay, I'm sure that Sharon <laughs> My apologies, I saw that, but I wanted to finish that thought. So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, yes, uh, okay. Director Fox, your question. Oh, so just a quick just a, the meeting and check that off. Yeah. And thank so you. I made, I made a motion to extend the meeting to 10 o'clock. Second. Can we make it 10 30? Um, I retract my motion. I make a motion to extend the move the, the meeting to 10 30. Second. Motion was made and seconded to extend the meeting to 10 30. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 
I don't think I heard Ben, but I'm sure he's fine. Um, I said I. Said I. <laughs> opposed, motion carries. My apologies, Dr. Ricky Smith and Sharon. Not at all. My apologies. Director Fox, your question. Yes, I just wanted to clarify, bus riders are not considered an additional quarter. Bus, by bus riders, are you talking about, um, you're talking about students, right? Correct. So okay, the so issue would be if I rode the the original um, guidance said that if you rode a bus that was one cohort and if you were in a classroom that was a second right, cohort. Right. And so now they're saying no, that's okay. not a cohort. You you have one to give in in the school itself. However, if you remember the slide from the, the my previous update, which mm -hmm. said if there is an exposure on the bus, those students still need to be quarantined. Okay, uh, that was that was the point. I yes. need a clarification. But, okay, thank well, you. But for cohorting purposes, mm -hmm. the student could ride the bus and be in two other, two additional cohorts. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the clarity. And just to clarify one step further, so if there is a case on the bus, all of the students who ride that bus must be quarantined, but Correct. not necessarily all of the students in those students' classes. That is also correct. Thank you. Yeah. And again, it gets back to the ABC exposure. Who had closest exposure? Okay, next slide, please. All right. Um, so what is required from our families? Um, we are direct and our staff. We are directing both students and staff to stay home if they have any symptoms of COVID. Um, and we are asking staff to be vigilant um, about their own personal behaviors as we come back in to hybrid. Um, even with vaccination, uh, we know that we will have some staff, and I will do a light touch of that here in just a moment, um, who will, per, for personal reasons, decide not to be vaccinated. Um, and we are asking them to be very thoughtful uh, about maintaining vigilance relative to, again, mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing, not taking any unessential trips, uh, anything that puts them in proximity um, to, um, to active cases of COVID and certainly now with report of uh, new variants um, afoot uh, within the state. Um, and uh, we will we continue to be in tight partnership with our public health authorities um, and work with them uh, relative to reporting if we've had a, a, pos a possible positive or a confirmed positive. We are responsible as a district for doing the, uh, the tracing and the notification. There is also um, support coming from the state here soon relative to uh, rapid testing kits. Um, it is state law that parents must give consent for any form of testing for students 18 and younger. Um, and so as we have greater information about how those tests can be delivered, and the belief is, is that they can be self-administered even as young as five years old. Um, but we, I have as yet to see the specifics on that as do other area superintendents. But that will be one more tool in our arsenal in terms of being able to offer um, a rapid test um, if they're in the presence of fever or other signs that give us cause to suspect um, a COVID infection. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this has not changed in the RSSL. We are required to have a minimum of 35 square feet per, of distance for the student and for the teacher. We are to minimize standing in line and to ensure that the, the floors are marked so that students know where six feet are from, from the next student. Um, and uh, we are also, uh, as part of the checklist, determining patterns, traffic patterns as flow in and flow out that don't cross each other. Next slide, please. Uh, again, face coverings are required. Um, the district will and has ample stock of face masks, um, as well as gloves, um, face shields uh, where, where necessary, um, and disposable gowns uh, for those that are working directly with high, highly impacted students. Um, face coverings are required for students, and uh, unless they are uh, have, an, have it written into their IEP or are well known relative to having special um, ed concerns, uh, those are one. Are those students and families are, have been identified, and Director Kinch is working with those families. All others are required to use masks uh, during the school day and when on the bus. Next slide, please. 
And again, just to, re a re a, to reinforce, face coverings are not a choice. It is a requirement if you are coming into, into hybrid. Uh, and OSHA requires um, that we provide face coverings for staff. And, and we, again, we have ample supply of those. Next, next slide, please. Question is, has arisen, is it okay to eat at school? The answer to that is yes. Um, and we are working with our nutritional services um, to find ways of um, offering meals that are easy to eat at one's desk so that we minimize the amount of contact relative to, to cafeteria. The bigger concern has to do with the adults in the system uh, typically congregating in, um, the, uh, in a staff room um, and that will not be allowed. It'll, we'll have to find uh, ways to encourage teachers um, to eat in their rooms during uh, their, their break um, between um, half day cohorts, which Dr. Lisa will be speaking to here in just a moment. Um, but again, trying to mitigate as many opportunities for congregation of staff as possible and students. We are also asking that families consider who are coming into hybrid that if a student is bringing um, a meal, that it be ready to go. So it minimizes the amount of contact that the teacher must have directly in terms of opening containers, um, cartons of milk and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. And this is just a summary exclusion. I will not go through it this evening, but at the very top of this chart, it gives you the most likely scenarios that, that schools would have to navigate. And then a, a think through, a flow through chart as to what action should be taken um, and when the student and or staff member is appropriate for return to the school. But we would encourage uh, individuals to take a look at this further if they have interest. Next slide, please. Um, it is required that we train all staff prior to any in-person and that is being developed. Um, we also have um, developed protocols for communicating with staff, family in the school when there is a new case of COVID. And that is something that Director uh, Tracy Rose is very familiar with working with our staff, um, given the number of positive cases that we had during the last spike um, and notifying um, tracing and notifying all, all parties that were potentially impacted. Um, we also have very strong public health guidance uh, and thanks to the work of Carol Kinch and the health, the health team that meets on a weekly basis and they continue to review and revise um, updates uh, and training pre and prepare potential trainings um, as we receive new information from County Health. Next slide, please. Dr. McCall, if you'd like to give just a brief update relative to the proposed pre-K-5 elementary schedule. Um, and uh, as I've shared earlier this evening, there are elementary school meetings at each of the schools virtually this week. Dr. McCall. Yeah. Good evening, um, Chair Wolf, uh, Vice Chair Bowman, Directors, Student Reps. It is my pleasure to um, just touch on uh, what does that mean for uh, TTSD? I want to... Um, just reiterate what Dr. Sue mentioned is that it is our belief that in-person instruction is the best model in order to provide uh, key academic learning as well as to provide um, social emotional um, support as well. And so uh, back in the fall and even before that, we had a team of administrators which included uh, teacher reps, specialists, and others working on a hybrid model. And we have uh, presented that model and revisited the model to come up with what we believe uh, would focus and prioritize our pre-K um, to five students with a, um, a phased in approach. And that hybrid model is really a mix or blend of uh, synchronous and asynchronous learning. And our proposal uh, would be a half day model. And that would mean that our um, pre-K to five students would be attending in person half days for four days a week. And then they would still have an opportunity to do, um, um, get a lunch as well as um, applied learning asynchronously. And we have a timeline which prioritizes our um, 
pre-K to one students doing a phased in approach. And that would mean that we would start with the littles and the staff that would support them. Also, just keeping in mind, really the goal and the purpose of instruction is to uh, increase uh, participation, uh, engagement, as well as focus mainly on uh, academic achievement and then providing opportunities for students to develop peer and, and adult connections, as well as um, relearning in-person routines. And in the case of our uh, pre-K and our kindergarten students, this will be um, a new experience for them as well. And the rationale for the half days is to provide for the consistency of our students and with the focus on literacy and math, and then uh, provide opportunities for um, some interventions for our students who need more uh, tiered uh, two or three um, strategies. Our okay. staff, meaning our um, elementary principals, will be hosting, like Dr. Sue said, um, school-based community meetings starting tomorrow. And at those meetings, um, principals will share the uh, schedule with parents. They will uh, discuss and share what does it look like, what safety pro protocols that we will be following based on our um, blueprint and our guidance from ODE, giving the families that information so that they can make an informed decision as to whether they feel comfortable of the, with their students returning in person or giving them the option to stay in online um, CDL. Dr. Lisa, and the, the half day is that there will be a half day morning cohort and a half day afternoon, correct? Yes, there will be two cohorts, morning and afternoon. And again, smaller classroom sizes, four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. Okay, thank you. And, and again, because of, because of our, our student class sizes uh, and enrollment, uh, even with, with the you know, lower number um, for us to be able to meet the square footage requirements uh, and to keep the cohort size uh, within those requirements, requires us to split out the cohorts to achieve that. Um, and then again, for consistency sake, um, some districts have looked at two full days and then another two full days. Um, and we believe that uh, having daily contact, except for those Wednesdays, which I have been negotiated um, and is in the MOU agreement at this point in time, mm -hmm. now any shift for that Wednesday would have to be renegotiated. Um, and uh, that is not our primary focus at this point in time. Our primary focus is to get students into hybrid um, and to give them as much consistency um, and, and uh, time with teacher as possible uh, during the week. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Lisa. You're welcome. Next slide, please. Clarifying question? Yes. When the, the student is in, in school with, with their small cohort in the morning, then they go home in the afternoon, they then have no um, online communication with the teacher at that point? Is that correct? Or that is correct. What they are doing is they are doing the homework um, and other asynchronous learning in the afternoon. And if you are coming in the afternoon, you're working on that in the morning. And the teacher will purposely set lessons um, so that they had that opportunity to continue that work um, in, in, in the other half of their day. But they won't be watching the other half? No, no. that is correct. From YouTube channel? No, okay. That Thank is you. correct. All right. Next slide. Just, just another quick question about yes. schedule. Who will, who who gets to eat lunch there? So is it the morning cohort or the afternoon? Um, I believe both cohorts will have an opportunity to uh, have lunch. Yes. Okay. Other questions? All right. Thank you. So um, I I wish to. Um, Thank Director Bowman for and, and Director Zurchme for bringing to fact how fluid the situation relative to uh, teacher vaccination has been over the last several weeks um, and has caused um, a fair amount of challenge. Um, well, not a fair amount, has caused significant challenges 
um, in getting to a solid date um, uh, relative to workforce readiness. Uh, we believe that prioritizing our staff to be fully vaccinated prior to uh, reopening is a key component uh, in our commitment uh, for health and safety of all. And this was reiterated again today in an ODE uh, document, basically sharing that this is uh, yet one more layer of protection um, in, in the arsenal of getting students in then as quickly as possible and keeping them in because our staff and our, our teachers uh, who are supporting our students um, have that level of protection. That said, uh, I also want to um, continue to highlight the collaborative efforts uh, with our association. While many of the messages have been difficult to hear um, and, it, 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 and conversely, um, they have acknowledged that they understand and hear the passion and the pain that our parents um, are experiencing. And I wish to thank the directors this evening as well for highlighting those voices because both have preeminence um, and both um, have, have right passion um, and, uh, and have concerns. And our job is to weigh both of those and, and you know, balance those so that everyone's need to the best of our ability can be met while we are moving forward. And one of the things that we um, navigated with our associations is that if staff wish to volunteer or staff who are choosing not to be vaccinated will be called to duty. Um, and uh, we appreciate those who have volunteered while they wait for the vaccine that will help us more easily stand up limited in person. Uh, but we also understand that we have a continuum of teachers, many of whom are to believe that they need two vaccines um, before they feel um, adequately protected and safe to come into the workspace. And so um, we are fortunate in our district in terms of the collaborative effort um, and the stewardship that we are, are, are trying to give. While at the same time, um, I have been very clear, many of the directors here this evening have sat in on my sit with Sue's and I have been clear with our teachers that our community is not truly happy um, with some of the decisions that we are making and are disappointed that teachers um, have taken this stance and that it is the, our responsibility as individual communities to reach those parents um, and to continue to work with them and understanding their students' needs um, as we are moving, uh, moving them through. That is our obligation. I know that there are other districts in our area that are not as fortunate in terms of their attempted collaborative effort um, and have are either navigating challenges relative to um, high numbers of staff filing for leaves of absence, um, or in some cases um, being at, at an impasse. Um, that has not been our experience today. Um, and uh, I, I want us to continue to move forward uh, and problem solving together while listening very carefully to our community's needs. And so where we stand now with the vaccination, and again, as a reminder, uh, I know that the Board of Directors knows this, but to our community, um, the fact that teachers are being vaccinated at all um, was a, um, a, a direct effort of superintendents across the state. And most, I can speak most specifically to the group that I was a part of for the TriMet region um, and working with our healthcare partners at Legacy, Peace Health, OHSU, um, and Kaiser Permanente. Um, where we brought a plan to them to bring us vaccine and they said, we'll give you the Oregon Convention Center and we'll stand that up for your teachers because we know that this is so important. Um, and then we had many back and forth um, because OHA felt that there wasn't enough vaccine and then there was, um, and now there is enough to get us started. But at the same time, they believe that um, additional teachers needed to be added to the 1B designation and so have included early learning um, uh, program teachers as well as private school teachers. That will add another 30,000 individuals in the TriMet area uh, to all of the other uh, public school and district staff, which stands at about 45,000. So uh, I would offer you a visual that um, with, with the original plan, there is a, a belief that we could get through everyone's um, district within three weeks with one dose. With this addition um, of another 30,000, it's as if we have um, added um, bumper to bumper trying to get onto I-5 um, in the midst of um, uh, the height of, uh, of rush hour. 
and so we know that that potentially we have been told uh, OHA's decision will potentially add another week to two weeks in terms of getting everyone vaccinated. For that reason, we have, because of our commitment to activating Lippy and activating uh, early, early learning um, and early elementary, our district in, in the first push, which will go out on Wednesday, the, the staff that has been prioritized to receive uh, vaccinations this week are elementary pre-K, kinder, and first grade teachers, learning specialists, learning specialist uh, assistants, principals, counselors and school psychologists, office staff, custodian, food service, bus drivers, long-term substitutes, all elementary facing. Um, are all teachers who are, are will be needed to stand up a K-12 limited in-person sessions, quality custodians, because that is where the initial push relative to um, the uh, special ed limited in person will be housed and, and Director Kinch spoke to that earlier this evening. Our bus drivers that are elementary facing, Creekside and um, uh, Tigard High School daycare, Creekside limited in person and volunteers for the secondary limited in person. That is first wave. The second wave is then um, all the um, teachers relative to grades two, three, and if we are fortunate enough, four, five, um, and it is a rolling um, piece. It is not this week, it's this one, and the next week, it's the next. As soon as they can get through the group that I've just given to you, they will tee up the next group um, in order. The way teachers and staff will access those um, appointments is that they will have a chat bot link. So Director Fox, to your concern about people spreading and sharing the link, this is the health system's way of trying to shut that down and make sure that only individuals uh, who should be on this priority list and are on the priority list that we, we gave to the system today um, are receiving a chat bot. The chat bot is a conversation um, that uh, assesses the individual, are they appropriate for vaccination? and then gives them the link for uh, to make an appointment. They make an appointment at the Oregon Convention Center. Um, and uh, we have asked, and the healthcare system has um, been generous in supplying times from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. to facilitate uh, the teaching day. I'm gonna stop there for just a minute and see if there are questions about that process. All right. We know that the teachers and staff will be will most likely be receiving the Pfizer vaccine, which means that they will be eligible for their second dose in 17 to 21 days. We have been told by the system that those doses will be set aside um, and so there will be a second dose. Um, with that, if we can get uh, this first wave that I've just given you through, it is entirely possible, depending on if they get through this, this, this week into next week, that we could have a target date of mid-March for K pre-K through grades one um, for hybrid to return in person and then continue to phase in uh, grades two, three after that, and then four five after that. I am loath at this point to give a hard date, um, as all districts in the TriMet area are, simply because we really need to see how, the, how quickly this is going to run. And for that reason, um, I, the best I can give at this point is we believe it's this based on how this works. So um, the time for the first dose, the time for the second dose, immunity building, and then ready to go. Um, all pre-K-3 staff who are assigned to hybrid are expected to report whether they have availed themselves of the vaccine or not when we are ready to go. And Director Kinch has already given you the information relative to um, the beginning um, of standing up Libby this week. Next slide, please. Dr. Sue, before you move on to the next yeah. slide, can I ask a question? With yeah. regard to prioritization of that, of that cohort of the um, pre-K through three, um, um, the set of classified and, and licensed staff. Has there been any thought about prioritizing the most medically fragile or older um, people as opposed to everybody having the same level of priority in case there is a slowdown, um, that there may be an option to get some folks back in? 
Uh, I think the, the, the issue here, Director Fox, is number one, based on, again, the metrics have not gone away. Even though they are advisory, we still must follow them. And so we are prioritizing staff where the metrics allow us to stand up hybrid, which is in pre-K elementary. Again, back to that orange column. And so any, any teacher, whether they are medically, depending on, on their need, if they are pre-K through uh, grade one teacher, they will be in this first list because that will help us stand up that which we can stand up based on the advisory metrics. Okay. Yeah, what, what I was just wondering is if, say, if it slowed down and we were, we did have our most fragile um, elementary, you know, pre, the pre-K through three um, immunized, there would be a lot less risk, right, for those. So if so, my only concern is if, this, if, if the immunizations are a lot slower than we're projecting, um, whether, I, I'm just afraid we're rolling in now to April, you know, if it, so my only question, it doesn't sound like that's a consideration or that's a, that's a um, possibility. I guess I, I, perhaps I'm not understanding the full intent of your question. So, so within, within that cohort itself, the, all the teachers and staff say that a 20 year old teacher getting the immunization in that cohort, the pre-K through three versus a 50 year old teacher with, you know, diabetes and heart disease. Would that, is there the same level of priority across those? Yes, because we want to be able to stand, at this point, we want to be able to stand up all of our schools, uh, elementary schools at that level, as close to the same time as possible. Okay, I guess I was just um, asking from the risk mitigation standpoint, you know, take care of the most fragile first. And so then if we did, then would that give us more options later on? That's all I was asking. So, okay. Uh, that's I, I, think, I think the challenge here, Director, when we talk about barriers is that mm -hmm. staff, regardless of where they are relative to risk, mm -hmm. um, have indicated um, as an association that they, they will not return without vaccination. So whether you're 20 okay. years old okay. or whether you're 50 years old, um, at this point, it is what grade level do you serve? All right. And to reach all of them. Mm -hmm. simultaneously. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Next slide, please. Regarding athletics, um, all OSAA athletics and activities at this time are tied to the county COVID designation, not, not the school advisory metrics per OSAA mandate. And this is at the direction of the governor and OHA. So to the question, what is the barrier to athletics? It is the guidance that OSAA is receiving from the governor and from OHA. And so the advocacy is pointed in that direction. Right currently, as long as we are tied to those metrics, we can only allow um, outdoor conditioning sessions um, and no contact athletic sports or in indoor conditioning as long as, as the governor has us still designated in a high risk or extreme high risk category. Now, based on the fact that the, the numbers are coming down, it is hopeful that that will, will change. But what we really need um, for athletics uh, to, to be able to engage in contact sports um, is for a different direction um, or a revised direction that reflects uh, the same thinking and flexibility relative to the advisory metrics from the governor's office and from OHA. Uh, on January 27th, um, the TriMet superintendents has a representative on OSAA's board. Uh, we have uh, in, in Washington County conversation superintendents meeting today, uh, we have collectively asked uh, that they carry a letter to OSAA uh, forward to from them to the governor and to OHA that basically asks for that flexibility so that we can engage in contact sports. Um, TTSD will also sign on to the Oregon Athletic Coaches Association letter that is directed to the governor and OHA in support of a spring season of contact sports schedule. And right now, both high schools have developed um, competition schedules for football and for volleyball. And should that guidance um, be lifted and flexibility be given, we would be prepared to pivot. Um, direct district fields and playgrounds have been reopened for general public use only. 
Uh, Director Darren Bernard and team are working with our community sports teams uh, to uh, establish guidelines as to uh, when it might be feasible for um, them to use the fields. Uh, right now we are protecting it for our student athletes. Um, and while at the same time balancing access for our community at large. Um, again, I remind the community that there is signage that's posted that it basically expects that masks will be worn when on the, on the property. And already we've had reports over the weekend as we've opened these fields up that people have not complied. Um, and we ask you, please, um, please comply. Please help us bend that curve. Please help us flatten that curve. Please help us get our kids back into school. Dr. G, can I ask you, can I ask you a question about this one? So, so in terms of the 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 um, community sports um, organizations, the youth baseball, youth soccer, etc., can you explain again what the situation is there relative to them accessing and using fields, and, and what the process is for evaluating that? You bet. Uh, Director Bernard, Darren Bernard, um, I believe you're on this call, and I would actually defer to you because you are closest to that work. Yep, I'm gonna I'm on Susan's screen. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So right now we've had our campuses are open for community use, but no organized activities. So it's like youth sports, any type of organized games, things like that. So we've opened them up at, at your own risk. So we've opened up playgrounds. We've begun putting up basketball hoops again. Um, like Dr. Sue had mentioned this weekend, um, sounds like a lot of our elementary schools were packed with people, not social distancing, pick up basketball games, all the stuff that is the reason why we took down the basketball hoops in the first place, right? And so um, we are going to aggressively, you know, try to continue to put up signage. Signage keeps getting taken down, unfortunately, but we do expect our patrons to, if they're going to use our, you know, schools, just like our athletes have to wear masks when they are doing their conditioning, we want kids using the covered play area or playgrounds use, you know, using their mask. We have, um, as Dr. Sue had mentioned, we're really trying to, we're not uh, making any property available at the high schools because we're reserving that for our own kids because depending on the school, you could have multiple sports. We could have seasons, um, you know, in the spring, we could have a lot more than our typical spring sports going, right? And so we, and we really want to protect our high school kids and keep those cohorts as pure as possible. I think as we get in, get along here further, we'll start taking a look at our elementary properties, our middle school properties. And um, depending where we're at with metrics and things like that, we'll start making assessments on whether we make, you know, when and whether we make those available to youth sports. The park, like right now, because of the weather and winter, all the parks are closed. They don't allow field use because one one soccer game out there can can destroy a field in the current conditions, right? And so we're in the same boat. But we our goal is to get our kids out there. We want them to be active. We want them to be participating. Um, but we also want to make sure they're they're staying safe because ultimately we need to get back to school. Did that answer your question, Director Bowman? Yeah, I think it does. And I'm just thinking through I, part of the thing I'm wondering about is if we do open up to community partners more so than general public, that those groups could be forced to could be required to comply with a higher level of um, accountability for safety mm -hmm. in terms of distancing and masks. And um, so I was just curious about how that so so basically you're saying there's an ongoing evaluation of when and whether to um, open up fields um, aside from high schools to um, local youth sports. That, that's correct. Danny's been in contact with almost all of our youth sports organizations. I can say our youth sports organizations have done a really nice job coming up with their own health and safety plans and they've shared them with us. And so they're ready to roll when we're ready to open up and stuff. And so now the challenge there is, you know, oftentimes those are parent volunteers that coach those teams, right? And so the consistency and the accountability is a little bit of a challenge sometimes, depending on which group. But, um, I, you know, those groups are anxious to get going just as much as we'd love to get them going. And so they do have plans and really thorough plans. So we are, um, you know, right now we're just kind of holding in, in pause right now. But once um, we feel like we're in a, in a position to start opening up some of our fields, we'll probably start opening up the elementary fields first. Um, and then the high schools, 
will be the very last one just because we want to make sure we take care of our cohorts and all of our athletic teams at the high school without mixing in a bunch of different cohorts from the community. And you, the good news here in Dredge Bowman is the fact that athletics is not considered a cohort similar to, to bus travel. So um, if you have, uh, let's say a student has um, um, two lippy opportunities um, and also wants to be in athletics, that is a change as well. So you can still do that and, and it's, it's, it's not considered part of the cohort. Um, uh, so, and I think that is a recognition as to the power of, um, you know, athletics and, um, and co-curricular activities. Uh, I also wish to um, state that uh, currently plans have been approved for both for performing arts, both choral as well as band and orchestra. The challenge right now is that the weather is not friendly to band instruments and, and, um, and orchestra instruments, um, but uh, those plans have been approved um, and they're good to go. Um, and so when I'm also talking about um, football and uh, volleyball, uh, there also is a plan in place uh, ready to go relative to cheer um, and uh, to the other athletics as well. It's really dependent upon uh, coaches who are willing to volunteer and step into the space. Um, and so uh, that is work that is ongoing at, at this point. Um, let me also just kind of go listening to some of our public comment this morning, this afternoon, this evening, uh, sorry, this evening, try to step through a couple of the pieces that I don't believe we've touched on directly, uh, relative to, um, what does it local control means? Um, the governor has basically left it two districts. Um, and in, um, our definition, I see that is both the district coming forward to the board, um, and, um, making a recommendation to the board as to. Uh, as to its plan. It does not require that the board uh, give final approval. Um, ODE has been clear about that. Um, and the uh, second piece with this uh, is relative to um, liability. Um, and I wondered if uh, there were any questions about that before I just do a light touch, um, but I, I'm certainly happy to answer that question as well. Um, Dr. Sue, I think it's fair. I mean, I, I think two things, because I was going to, uh, also ask you about the board's role, but I think it's fair that we as individuals show a sign of support or disapproval for this plan. I mean, it is an operational plan. It isn't our place to approve it as an action item, uh, but I also think it's fair for us to show um, support or not, um, because at the end of the day, that's what I feel like our constituents are asking us where we are in support of this plan. And then um, in terms of liability, Sue, if you want to touch on, I believe that the revision of the metrics and the alignment was also in with the liability, but I'll let you speak. Yes, to that. correct. And so um, the districts received uh, direct um, guidance from uh, executive OSBA executive director, Jim Green, who was also an attorney. Um, we have had uh, the current uh, advisory metrics and RSSL vetted um, by uh, uh, our attorneys, uh, as well as there has been a request to the Department of Justice. Um, so, and taking a look at the way uh, that might impact uh, current uh, limited liability law. Um, and the guidance is this that if you are following the advisory metrics uh, as to uh, when you bring in certain grade levels um, and you stay within that guidance and the RSSL, um, that uh, the liability, limited liability is in force. Um, can districts choose not to follow the advisory metrics? Absolutely, they can. Um, and at which point, um, uh, based on, on guidance from attorneys and guidance from OSBA, you would be outside the limited liability um, uh, protections uh, of the law. And so, so just to clarify that what that means is if we open when we don't meet the metrics, then we could be, we open ourselves up to a financial liability of lawsuits from teachers, parents, students, et cetera, for essentially putting their, putting their students in harm's way would be the allegation and it could be litigated in court. That's what we're talking about. That is correct. Okay, thank so, you. So just to clarify though, do teachers fall under workman's comp or this covers all? I, just uh, yeah, I, I believe they would, they would fall under uh, workman's comp. Um, but we can certainly get clarity on that point. So, Sue, so just to summarize then to the, the obvious 
you know, question that I think along the way and Director Bowman just kind of asked one more clarifying point, why not ignore the metrics altogether, right? Say, you know what, let's just open up the doors. Um, and I've heard you talk about where our teachers are, our agreements with them, Dr. or Director Bowman brought up where we are with liability. And, and so I guess I'll, I'll open that question to you to any other um, comments that you'd like to, to make as that's been a, a, you know, a question of our parents. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things that I heard loud and clear even beginning in the fall from many of our parents, uh, many of whom are represented here this evening, uh, was uh, Dr. Fauci's um, urging, and I was pointed in the direction of uh, the Harvard Global Health Initiative. Uh, I think the fact that the state now has anchored into that, and if the Harvard Global Initiative is saying about 350 is about as far as you can push it uh, without having um, multiple outbreaks. Again, this is not the point that the school district, the school itself is the point of contact. It is the fact of what is coming through the door. That's the science. And so where Oregon took a very limited point of view, if you remember back in the fall, the first set of metrics said no more than 50. Then the second set said 200. And now based on Harvard and, and their vast body of information, not just nationally, but globally, says that 350 is about the, about the tipping point. If you go beyond that, you will set yourself up for potentially more free, greater frequency of positive cases coming through your door. And at that point, you are now in a position where you may have to shut down multiple cohorts repeatedly over and over and over again. That is something that we're trying to avoid. Um, and so again, anchored in the science, um, anchored in, in science that, uh, that we owe, you know, Dr. Fauci and, and others are saying, yep, that, those are good guidelines. And he himself has said on multiple occasions, it is dependent on the level of active disease in your community that you must attend to. Schools can operate safely, but the higher the, the level of active disease in the community, the higher the likelihood is it's coming through your doors and you'll have to deal with it. And you may be dealing with it on multiple fronts. And so I believe that, that following that advice um, is uh, again, anchored in science. And as I shared with you before, as a former trauma, uh, public health and critical care nurse um, with over a decade's worth of experience, um, I believe that there is, is strong validity to that. That's okay. the reason why I am actively engaging us in, in terms of multiple opportunities relative to limited in person so that we can deal with the isolation concerns um, because I firmly believe that for as much as I, I beg our community to follow, uh, follow the guidance, we may yet have another spike before it's all said and done. Even at that point in time, if our elementary schools are up and running and they're running without a further incident, we will continue to run. And that also is provided for in the guidance. It's just that you can't add more grade levels at that point in time. So we would continue to run Lippy, we would continue to run sports, we would continue to run the, the grade bands that we have stood up at that point, as long as they are running without incident. Okay, oh, I, one, oh, oh, sorry. Excuse me. No, uh, Sharon, go ahead. Um, uh, Dr. Sue, I, um, just a clarifying question, and maybe this is for Dr. McCall, but um, the survey that was um, questioned in, in the previous, in some of the public comments, I assume that's going to happen after these meetings this week. Is that, that was what implied? That's correct. That yes. Okay. yes. And Parents will have an opportunity to use, uh, families will have an opportunity to use uh, parent view to uh, select uh, hybrid or in-person. Okay, thank you. And how do people get invited to those meetings? Is that on each school's website or is that on the district website for what, what day is the Bridgeport elementary meeting, for example? Or will parents have been communicated that directly? Lisa? Yeah, so that information is would go out through the schools and it should be on their website. Uh, I will double check that. So if, if parents haven't gotten um, any notice thus far, they should 
they should check the website and if it's not on there, they should call the school. Is that, e is that yes, yes, okay. but I will double check. Okay, thank you. So the, the one the one place that I wanted to ask a question that we haven't talked a, a bunch about yet tonight is um, the sort of labor relations teacher side of things. So we saw some districts come out with an announcement about going back to in person who then had to come back, um, walk that back and push that date back, um, right. largely attributed to, to workforce issues and teachers. So my understanding is that um, teachers through their, their union, through TTA, have certain legal rights in this process about working conditions. Um, and, you know, I understand that some districts have, have received a demand to bargain and that that process can, um, can extend for an extended period of time. And so I'm curious, can you kind of give us an overview of what are the, what are the legal considerations of your negotiation, your communication with TTEA? Um, because I think it was, you know, uh, obviously, uh, TTA president Scott Heron spoke at the last meeting, but I think it's important to also understand that it wasn't sort of just on a whim. TTA actually has legal rights um, in this process. And um, I'm not an expert on this area, but I know you are. So if you can give us an overview of that relationship and process. Well, I'll, I'll give a brief overview and, and certainly in Director Ebert, if you have other things that, that would be helpful here. Um, yes, we are, because uh, we have public, um, public entities, state entities and public school districts, um, uh, their workforce is protected by um, collective bargaining agreements. Um, teachers and classified staff have the option to either become a member um, or to have a relationship that allows them some protection um, if, they, if they so wish, or they can opt out um, based on the Janus, one of the, the recent Janus Supreme Court ruling. Uh, that all being said, the preponderance of districts workforce um, are represented by either by a classified union or a uh, the licensed uh, union and affiliate of Oregon Educator Association. And there are contractual rights. Um, one of those has to do with working conditions, uh, both physical as well as workload. Uh, and those have to be negotiated. Uh, and so when a, when a unit raises a concern, um, as units have across the state, as, and, and very specifically in the TriMet area, that they believe that it is not safe to come back in until they can have a vaccine because the vaccine is available. If the vaccine were not available, we would probably be having slightly different conversations um, and a slower rollout. Um, but this is something that is that, that the, the, the associations in every district in the TriMet area have brought to bear. Um, and I believe that you will see across the TriMet area many boards um, affirming that that is, that is the stance and that uh, they want their to, they are affirming the, the, the concerns that they are raising relative to uh, the labor management relations that we have uh, with them. What I will say is, as I shared earlier, and thank you for, for raising that, that concern, districts who basically said, this is when we're going to start, um, had, did, are now do, tilling some of the ground that we have been tilling for a very long time to get us to where we are now without a demand to bargain, without um, a, a potential um, high number of staff filing for leaves. Um, or uh, you know, signaling in other ways, similar to the May 8th walkout, um, that uh, they would not be reporting for duty. And the reason for that is that they care deeply about their students, they care deeply about their work as you, it was witnessed earlier this evening, but they also um, are, are deeply afraid. Um, and uh, this is, and that is what an association does. It brings those concerns to the table and it's the responsibility of the district management in this case, to navigate with them and go through the language um, and have the conversation to continue to move the system forward uh, without getting to an impasse. Um, and so uh, we, all districts value that relationship. Sometimes it can be very thorny and very passionate and very heated. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it, it, the, the reality is, is that if a workforce decides um, that it, it um, is deadlocked with you. Um, there are not enough subs in the area for any of us um, to fill those positions if teachers decide to either request leave um, or resign or in other ways um, decide not to continue to engage in, in, um, in their profession in, in, in a given district. 
and that is their labor right. Thank you, that's a very helpful overview. Any other questions for me? I know that's a lot of information. Sue, was that your last slide? Yes, ma'am, it is. Um, so I guess um, all I'd like to say, because the board will not be voting on this specifically, um, there are tremendous variables in place um, to put this plan together. And then um, I was telling someone the other day, I feel like we're making decisions in a jello bowl. I mean, every time you do something, it, it you know, slides away. It's somewhat something else the next day. And um, I guess I just want to um, thank uh, Dr. Sue, her team, uh, to be um, huge advocates. Sue has worked so hard in terms of how do we thoughtfully get our students, get our teachers safely back into schools to try to, to, to move that, to elevate so that we could do this as quickly as, and thoughtfully as possible. And so I appreciate those efforts. I appreciate what you're doing. I'm frustrated. I want kids back in school more than anything. As we said, point one, that's the best place for students to be. But I believe based on all factors applied, you are applying the right strategies for how we move forward. Athletics for secondary, for high school, I absolutely support the efforts to get sports back in play. As Dr. Sue said, TTSD will sign on. I signed on personally. Um, as a school board member this morning, I encourage you all to advocate for that for our secondary students as well. Um, and I just felt like I needed to say that um, during the board meeting that I um, am supporting the direction that TTSD is headed given all the variables. So I'll leave that open to any other board member that cares to share. I'd like to <clears throat> reiterate and add my support um, these have been extraordinarily challenging times and I think the district is doing a remarkably good job. I keep coming back to um, my, my, my personal feeling, which is that I don't want to ask a teacher to go into a school um, and do something that I wouldn't be willing to do. And if I were not vaccinated, I would not be comfortable going into a classroom with 15 or 20 kids, knowing how intimate and, and, and contact rich um, elementary school is and how much snot is often involved. Um, so I, I'm not willing to ask a teacher to go into a school unvaccinated um, because I'm not willing to do the same. And so that's been my sort of litmus test through all of this. And so I'm very glad that the district has reached the point of saying we will send teachers back when they are vaccinated. Yeah, I will also just briefly um, echo the support that I'm hearing. And I, I think I agree with Jill in that I believe um, this is the right thing to do. And I think we're headed down the right path. And I think that we're, we're I hope and believe that we're moving quickly to, to get to um, limited in-person access for students who need it. Um, and then gradually from there expanding. But I also think that this is um, the most realistic um, and um, prudent path forward as well. And that, you know, Dr. Sue put forward some very complex three-dimensional chess components that have to be, um, that have to be weighed and that have to be considered. And I don't think, um, I don't think it's a simple decision. I think there's a lot of variables and I think the district has done the absolute best job they could to balance these factors. Um, acknowledging that we have messed up as a district like everyone has in this pandemic and we're trying to correct things as quickly as possible. But um, I genuinely feel like we're doing the best that we can in this plan and its growth and progression is reflective of that. So I am, I'm in support. Um, I'm also um, so grateful for um, the countless hours uh, our district staff has put into trying to make this work and being able to pivot with the ever-changing circumstances, ever-changing regulations and policies, um, not to mention the ever-changing uh, uh, disease. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say I do um, support the plan. Um, I, um, I concerned about the, the vaccines being delayed further 
but we don't have any control over that. I think we'll revisit that um, based on how things roll out, but um, I just wanna say I'm supportive and I wanna commend um, uh, Dr. Sue and uh, Director Ebert with all their work and working with our union. So thank you. Certainly. And I, because this plan implements all the current best practices that science offers um, to minimize the risk for all of our staff and students, and that our district has um, put in so much effort into the details, that everybody's aware of the details and that the training of the details will be there. I totally support this plan. I also support waiting for the vaccines. Um, for the teachers as they would be in a room, a room with students for many hours, which is a very different environment than a grocery store or a restaurant. Um, so I do feel like it is valid to put our teachers into a higher priority and to, um, and to, to view them that way. I want to say thank you um, uh, for sharing um, where, where you are um, as a board. Um, uh, I want to really reiterate that in terms of advocacy, it is to the governor and it is to the OHA. And if I were to ask for any strong point of advocacy in addition to our athletics, is that OHA um, and the governor stop shuffling the deck relative to um, level 1B. Um, relative to uh, teachers uh, and, and understand that our sense of urgency to get our children back in is directly related to the speed at which our partners can, can vaccinate. And that right now, the bottleneck is the amount of vaccine. Salem-Kaiser School District has all 7,000 of their workforce vaccinated round one because Salem Health Center was allowed to do that. We need the same level of advocacy for the TriMet region. Uh, and I appreciate your, uh, your understanding. If you hear some directness in my voice, it is because we worked with diligence to stand up a system that did not exist um, and offer it to OHA and then to um, have the deck reshuffled um, uh, what was challenging at, uh, at best this weekend. Um, and so um, I would continue to ask for our full bench press to help our state partners understand um, the urgency that we have to uh, comply. Um, and uh, we, we need every, every ounce um, of assistance, both in terms of number of people into the system and amount of vaccine available. I cannot see a high enough praise for our, our hospital systems. They have literally stepped into, in, in, into the arena they were fully participative from the beginning of that conversation, took us seriously and worked with us as partners. And I will always be grateful for that level of commitment and coordination that you do not typically see in that industry. So nothing but praise for those individuals um, and for the staff here who have spent, thank you for recognizing countless hours, all of us trying to get this thing done. Can I, Dr. Speak, can I ask a follow-up question? So, one thing that I was encouraged by in some of the emails that we're starting to see is a sense of alignment of folks. Say, I mean, people may not like the plan or think that the plan is perfect, but I think there is an agreement, like if we can work together on yes. fighting and advocating. So what do you have thoughts or recommendations on specifically <laughs> um, regarding, you know, the, the vaccines in particular, because that seems like the, the central point here. Is there is there a board resolution? Is there uh, an mm -hmm. audience that we should, I mean, I think if we can organize our community here to, to get together and push just like Salem's community did, let's do it and let's let's try to get things moving. I would say two points to that point again. Um, the, the advocacy is to OHA and to the governor's office because OHA, just like ODE, and you know this well, Director Bowman, um, is under the auspices of the governor's office. Um, and so as a point of information, um, what is needed in the TriMet area is half of, of the state's allocation at any one given time. Right now, the state really doesn't know how much vaccine is available. What we do know is that most of the, there was a, a large proponent that, that got 
focused to Marion County simply because they that was a county that literally was on fire with COVID. They were in the six, seven hundred per hundred thousand range and needed to get that under control. Totally get that and understand that. And the governor wanted to demonstrate that, that a system could be stood up. Um, and so kudos um, to Salem Health for, for blazing that trail. However, um, now that that's happened, they need a reallocation um, that comes into the TriMet area because I'm also mindful of our 80 year olds and our 70 year olds and our 65 year olds. Um, and I am, um, I am mindful of, of the medically fragile that Director Fox has brought forward and the director search means you have identified. Um, that needs to happen in tandem. And this is why it is so important that they think about those phasing in. If you've got a group, get them through as quickly as you can before you add anything else to that. And, it, and the way in which that was modeled um, on Friday was that there was room for both that and the 80 year olds. Now, because of this decision over the weekend, that has pushed all that back. And that's what I'm getting at is that um, once you have developed a plan, you need to stick to it and let us run it through um, and reallocate. So if I were gonna ask for advocacy, it would be reallocating the, the, the stocks to get us done. So that is as well as trying to work on the other pieces, I understand that they're under the gun as well, but the, but the Metro area has high, high numbers in addition to, to Marion County, get us done and get us under control so that we can then start to spread the good news out from that. And number two, um, relative to athletics um, and just making us a priority right now in terms of vaccination would be huge, absolutely huge.